Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. The Tap Room, the epicenter of your brand. We're excited to have a conversation on how you can make the most of your guest time at your brewery. We hope that you leave with greater strategies for success and inspiration to further maximize your brewery's tap room experience. After all, it's not just about making great beer, but also putting out world-class hospitality. But first, let's meet our guest. And because Mike, you are to the right of me, you get to go first. All right, perfect. Hello, my name is Mike Cornet. I'm one of the co-founders at Prize Brewing Company in Minneapolis. Uh, we've been around since, uh, well, we shipped beer since 2014. Our tap room and brewery opened in 2017. Uh, we started out as an alternating proprietorship in Minneapolis, just doing one beer, just kegs, going to about 20 bars and restaurants, uh, all being delivered by one of the other founders uh, and being sold. Uh, we then opened our tap room and brewery in 2017. and. Uh, we're currently one of the uh, one of the largest self-distributing breweries in the state of Minnesota. So really focused on tap room self distribution uh, and uh, and growing our production brewery. And Mike, I had an awesome time visiting your tap room during CBC while it was in Minneapolis. So fantastic space. I would love to visit during a spring day again because it was beautiful. But one quick follow up: Did you seek out the perfect wall to hop on with today? Because that green behind you is just a really fun color. Uh, no, this is just, uh, this is leftover. Now I would show you that uh, over on this side uh, is the Mississippi River. So our brewery is right on the Mississippi. It's much better looking, but I didn't want to be uh, upstaged by the river. Yeah, you didn't want to brag too much that you have the Mississippi right behind you. Yep. And you can green screen this out so you can put whatever you want back here. Right. I'll put the Mississippi River. <laughs> yeah, the, the, if, you, if any of you got to go during CBC, it's, it's a beautiful tap room. So Absolutely. Please. No other Andrew. Andrew with the other half. Great to have you today. Thanks for having me. I uh, appreciate being on, you know, uh, we've been making beer for about the same amount of time that, uh, that Mike's been, um, start off in a small little tap room in, in Brooklyn, uh, making, making some, uh, you know, single and double IPAs, hoping that the world will like them. And, uh, just, you know, nine year, we just celebrated our nine year anniversary. Um, and it's been a, it's been a wild ride. Um, and you know, it's, it's, I'm excited to talk about, uh, you know, our tap rooms and our experience, but I'm also really excited to listen, uh, to the, to the other panelists. Like it's really, um, what we're trying to give in hospitality, I think, is a is a is what craft beer is trying to give in hospitality is a much new world um, where where things have been changing uh, ever since COVID, um, where we we once were able to uh, you know open up the garage door and sell our beer and not really think about anything else. Um, now we're we're fighting against everybody just like, you know and trying to make the best experience and and not only have the best beer but also have someone come back and be like oh that that bartender was awesome oh that experience was great um, so it's it's interesting to hear all this. I love it. I'm excited to learn from you today as well. But one quick follow up for you, Andrew, you have two things on the wall behind you. I'd love for you to pick one and explain what it is. Uh, I'll pick this. Uh, no, this is all opposite. Uh, this one is uh, I'm, I, I tend to like uh, some street art. Um, and this is one of my uh, street artists that I enjoy. And he writes um, phrases. Uh, so he just came out with a bunch of them. But this one I keep moving the wrong way. Uh, this one, it says uh, overthinking will fucking kill you. Um, and so it's in, actually in my wife's office and I just, you know, hopefully she reminds, reminds herself of that from time to time where, uh, you know, don't sweat the small stuff because sometimes it will kill you. <laughs> I feel like I need to get that tattooed on my chest or my forehead. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's written with crayon. So it's like super, it's super strange. It's like, like, like oh yeah, it's my daughter's artwork, but right. yes. <laughs> I love it. Thanks for sharing. Tony, how about you? Tell everybody a little bit about yourself. How's it, everyone? Uh, my name is Tony Wren. I'm the uh, general manager and partner here at Maui Brewing Company in Kihei. Um, Maui Brewing started a little earlier than, than uh, you guys, 2005. We opened our doors in a small kind of brew pub environment uh, here on the west side of Maui. And uh, so restaurants and that kind of tap room experience has always been a part of our history uh part of our brand and uh over the course of the years you know we've grown a lot as a brand and uh currently our uh, hawaii production all happens here in uh, the south side of maui in a town called kihei uh, where we also have a very large restaurant uh tasting room um and uh, so we still operate you know the original location here on maui we uh we have our kihei location now and two other restaurants as well on the island of Oahu. Um, so here on, you know, in the state of Hawaii, we're kind of spread out uh, with a lot of water in between. 
Hawaii is one of the few states I haven't visited, and you gave me more of a reason to come. Yeah, well, you know, uh, there's lots of reason to visit, but we certainly try to lubricate that experience for as many people as we can. Um, you know, something about great sunny days on the beach and uh, a cold one after that. Sounds like a win. And Tony, behind you, you have a wall of really impressive looking something or others in frames. <laughs> Which one are you most proud of? Oh, you know, this is actually like kind of the leftover piles from what we put down in the tasting room and feel like we just had stacks of these, you know, plaques that were made over years uh, sitting in the corner of a room and one of the girls just tacked them up. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that uh, out of all of these, there's a really, there's actually a really cool photo that's kind of right behind my head a little bit. It's like right there. And that's a photo of uh, Garrett and Melanie back in, I think 2000 and, about 2005 when we first started brewing. And uh, that was our kind of old tasting room in, in Lahaina. And, uh, you know, sometimes you gotta just remind yourself how far you come and the people that were with you at the beginning. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool, you know, Cool picture to remind us of that experience. No, very cool. Thank you for sharing. And last yeah. but not least, Tim, you're up. Well, I, I had to move my view so you can actually see my backyard a little bit more. So you might actually. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks for having me on, Andrew. Uh, exciting crew to be with here. Uh, very accomplished entrepreneurs and uh, hospitality leaders. So um, well, my my background's crazy. Uh, I was in tech, and then I'm a beer nerd fanatic whatever you call it uh and really wanted to work on a brewery so my wife and i co-founded a brewery started in 2013 after i sold my tech company and then opened our door first one 2015 um full service very you know focused on food as much as uh as beer uh and then you know kind of opened our second one which is the one the photos are from so uh kind of love beer love food love hospitality and service and that kind of dragged me into this whole world. And then I said, you know, I really, really love tech too. So I went back into, uh, into restaurant technology because I felt like there was a, a better path uh, for it. And so my wife took over the breweries. Uh, so even the ones I'll be talking about here is my uh, sort of client number one, if you will. Uh, I come home every night and get told all the things that are good, but a lot of bad about what I'm doing uh, every day. And, so she runs the breweries, that, uh, but I, I live pretty close to them and I'm there all the time. Well, glad to have you today, Tim. And because everybody else had a really cool wall behind them or cool things hanging on their walls, you just have a drab and gloomy background. So I'll just throw yeah. you an off the wall question. Sure. You know, Tim, what's your favorite type of donut? Oh, you know what? This, why did you, did you, uh, this is like a, so there's, there's an ongoing saga at my brewery about donuts. Did you know about this or is this just random? Okay. I've been, trying to, random. I've been trying to get a freaking donut made at my brewery for, I don't know, six months. It was, I was like at war with the chef for forever. Uh, Cause we serve coffee in the morning and I was like, I just want a donut, just a glazed or a sugar donut. So honestly, a basic good donut doesn't, doesn't need a lot of fanciness. Although I, I will say there's something to be said for a savory like bacon or some kind of savory note on donuts. I think there's never a bad donut. Whatever my three-year-old picks out, probably going to be a good donut. Yeah, that's probably true. Now, I know today we're going to talk a lot about the ordering experience. So what I would love everybody listening to do is just close your eyes. And what we're going to do, we're going to go through each of our guests today, and we're going to have them describe, you know, when you walk into their tap room, what's the first thing they do and, you know, what your ordering experience is like. So Mike, you know, I'd love for you to just, you know, get everybody to close their eyes and tell us a little bit about what we expect when we walk into your tap room. All right, great. Well, uh, first thing is that uh, our tap room, uh, the patio is in front of the entire building. It's about 230 feet long. So we have people that come in from every direction because we're right on the river, right on the uh, river parkway. And we also have a large bike path and running path there. So uh, people are kind of coming from all over. So I think it was just kind of following in through green spaces. Uh, in the summer, people come in through the main door. Uh, first thing they see is uh, is the big menu sign, the bar to the right. Uh, the kitchen's very active to the left. 
Uh, and then you can kind of see seating going back straight ahead. Feather bowling, which is like a, a Belgian feather bowling, which is a, a game a lot like lawn bowling or bocce, uh, which is the back end of the brewery there. And then you can see the brew house and into production from there. Um, and that's really the, the experience. We are, um, one of the things that we've done recently is we have uh, started having a greeter at the door just to help people uh, be oriented. Um, so historically what we've done is had them come to the bar first and be oriented there, but we're now starting to uh, orient people as they come in, uh, handing them a menu, letting them know how our online ordering works, letting them know that if, they, if they're ready and they wanna just go find the table, that's great. If they have questions or wanna to talk to somebody, they can go to the bar or uh, come to the host station. So that's that's really what we're doing for that initial uh, that initial entry into the brewery into the tap room. I absolutely love that you have someone at that host station because setting those initial expectations with the guest is so important. Yeah, we definitely found that, uh, especially in tap rooms, that people are just used to going up to the bar. But we have a full kitchen. Uh, we have a full menu with uh, wood fired pizza oven in there as well. So we have a lot more to offer, and people don't exactly know uh, what to do. We also have uh, about 24 beers on tap. We have probably, I think, about 14 or 15 uh, bottles. So we have an offsite uh, mixed fermentation, uh, kind of wild sour and mixed fermentation program. Uh, so, and we also have barrel aged beers that are in bottles. So there's a lot of stuff to take in, a lot of content. And so we wanted to make sure that people understand uh, what what they're doing there and what, they, what, what we, have, we have to offer uh, when they come in the door. We also found that um, because we have the big menu sign up there that people really they don't want to jump directly in line. They actually will come in and come to the middle of the space. We used to have a lot of tables there. We actually cleared a lot of the tables out because we found that people will just come into a main entry room, almost like a vestibule, and they'll look at the menu and look around and they'll just kind of pause there for a little bit and take it in. And then when they're ready to order or, or, or uh, engage somebody, they'll step forward. And so we actually found that, and this is probably going too far, but we found that people like that idea of coming in and just being able to kind of absorb what's going on at first before they uh, immediately jump in line. No, yeah, that's so true. I think so often when all of us probably go into our own tap rooms or another tap room we frequent a lot, we know what to expect. But just imagine the first time you went in, you know, is the ordering experience clear and giving guests what they want is so important. That's right. And about half of our customers, if you look at the, uh, the data, uh, half of them are returning from, you know, if you look at the payment data, and half of them are new customers. So we always want to make sure that we're, we're kind of catering you know, equally to people that have been there before and people that come back regularly and those that are just there for the first time. Very cool. Thanks for sharing, Mike. Now, Andrew, with other half, you have a couple of taverns, mm -hmm. but I'd love to take a peek at your operation and have you kind of explain what we can expect if we were to visit. Sure. I mean, uh, all of them are a little bit different. Um, uh, the Brooklyn is a little bit more, uh, you know, industrial. Uh, a little bit down and dirty um, is where we started, but uh, one of the pictures of right now are, are, are Philadelphia, and um, that experience is, is really similar to what to what Mike was saying. Um, we found that you know it's a little overwhelming coming into other half. There's somewhere between twenty and thirty beers on tap. There's five to ten stout bottles. There's mixed firm. There's uh, you know there's beer made beer there from D.C., from Philadelphia, from Brooklyn, from Domino, from uh, Finger Lakes. Um, so it's it's a lot to take in, and, and that's where um, we we have a greeter at all times uh, at, at Philadelphia, um, and at most of our locations actually, um, even if we don't serve food, because um, we want to level set and get that expectation set. And I think that's one of the bigger things that we've really tried to push over the last year since COVID ended. Um, what people can expect when they come in, or what they're looking for, and and so we can um, you know not only meet those, uh, but also you know. If people come in and like, oh, do you have food? Or they're asking a bar, I'm like, no, we don't have that here, but you can do X, Y, and Z. Uh, just to make sure people know what's going on. Um, and we've found that really helpful. Um, you know, Philadelphia is a, a unique experience for us because we have such a huge outdoor space. Um, we have about somewhere between 250 and 350 people there on, on busy uh, weekends in the, in the summer and spring and fall. Um, and then that's where, you know, not to push, you know, Tim, but the Go tab has been helpful because we've been able to have someone at the at the front of the building uh, by the gate being like, okay, hey, if, if you see a QR code, you can order beer through GoTab there um, and, and have it delivered to you and it'll be there in like three or four minutes. Um, you can go to the bar, you can do this, you can do that. And that's where um, the flexibility has been really, really important for us. Um, as we have worked through these service models, the one thing that is constant is um, we wanna make sure that the experience um, 
it is, is kind of similar from when you would order through the bar or order through a QR code or, or for curbside pickup. Um, a lot of our business, and I don't know how the other guys are going, but um, a lot of our business is, you know, people ordering to go. And so you, how can you have that order ready? How can you uh, make sure that experience is still part of other half? Um, and that's what we've really been sort of holistically looking at how, um, our, how we're changing our website right now and um, everything, how they can all sort of flow together um, and give someone uh, that, that other half experience. Absolutely. And no matter how someone's ordering, you want to make it as frictionless as possible. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where, you know, we, we've really concentrated on um, getting the front of house together, getting service manuals, getting them to know what's expected. Uh, you know, not only what to set the uh, set examples for the for the uh, customers, but for the staff being like, you know, w there, there's a there's a couple like funny lines that we always get at other half. And that, um, it's, hey, what's your favorite IPA? And you're like, there's 16 on the board, man. Like, I need a little <laughs> bit more than that. Um, and we, and you know, it's just trying to get the, the bartenders to be like, I know you're going to get asked that 27 times today, but how are you going to be kind about that on the 27th time and say, all sister, everything is my favorite one this week. Hey, green city, uh, is one that we we're always making and is, and is available, you know, in, you know, around for distribution as well. And it's like just having these points of service and making sure the staff is, um, meeting before shift starts and getting those pre-shift meetings and the post-shift meetings and, and having all that stuff. And, and again, I'm not, not a, the go tab advocate here, but like having the, the integrations with the seven shifts and things like that, where you can see problems arising and you can also solve the problems. And that's, what's really been um, helpful um, as we've been uh, evolving our service model. And I can get nerdy with you all day long about pre-shift meeting, post-shift meetings. You even said manual, which it's awesome. You have all those systems in place. Yeah, we're trying. We have a, a great staff, uh, our, our HR department, Leah and our, um, I have a, a director uh, under me for, for service, uh, uh, Joy, and she's amazing. They both have, um, over the last year and a half, have really taken uh, a lot of pride in making sure we have manuals, making sure that there's a there's not only a you know a staff manual for everybody, but also making sure that there's a front of house manual. You know what, you know who Sam Richardson is. He's my partner in the brewmaster. And you know when someone, you know, will get phone calls like, hey, uh, can I speak to Andrew? And like, half of the, you want them to know who Andrew is. <laughs> and so it's just making sure Simple questions have simple answers. I love it. Now, Tony, you're up. What can we expect when we visit a Maui tap room? Yeah, I think, you know, our layout, especially here um, in our Kihei, kind of our flagship location where the brewery is, uh, is probably quite similar to what, you know, Andrew and Mike were describing about, um, you know, their their properties as well. It's kind of like you, you come up the, the hill here uh, away from the ocean and, you um, and boom, there's kind of a large building. So a lot of people are kind of wowed at just the, the size of our facility. Um, so we definitely want to guide our guests into an experience that um, we could kind of help them pre-qualify and determine like what the perfect path to go is. Um, similar to what, you know, uh, Mike and Andrew were saying about having a great uh, greet team to, to direct people. You know, as, as you walk up from the parking lot uh, here at our Kihei site, you know, you kind of walk by the beer garden, you know, you kind of get into the lobby, but you can't really see the rest of the um, kind of the facility from right in the lobby. It's a, it's a nice large place with a retail center and kind of a big front desk. But, you know, you can kind of take a right and go into the tasting room where, you know, that was kind of our original, you know, tap room where we have, you know, the funky uh you know, beer signs on, on the wall behind the taps. And uh, it also is, is the pathway to get into a tour, um, you know, visit the inside of the brewery, or you can kind of go, you know, straight back into the restaurant space itself, which you kind of see the picture of, you know, we've got these uh, big windows that look right into the brewery. And, you know, there's a few different areas uh, throughout our venue that we can kind of situate a guest, you know, based on, what they're looking for if they're just you know again looking to taste some beer or take a tour you know that might be one direction versus you know going up to the you know the main bar and uh, wanting that interaction with the bartender having that direct service having someone kind of like walk you through the thing or to just you know take your dog take your kids go out to the beer garden you know hang out you know kind of like what andrew's saying you know with with go tab you know that'll sell out is to have a whole other service model where, 
Now you can scan a QR code and, and really skip a lot of the other kind of steps, um, you know, for especially people that return, you know, members of our community, people that like to come over on a Saturday and just have lunch and, you know, throw, throw some uh, corn bags, right? Uh, you know, they, they just want to go out and um, not really be hassled by a whole lot of steps of service, you know, get their beer, uh, hang out with their friends and their family. Um, so our, our great team really is trained to, you know, kind of understand uh, what it is that our guests are looking for and, uh, and try to direct them in that direction. Um, for us, kind of uh, the volume of business is pretty high. Uh, you know, we can see anywhere between 800 to 1,200 people come through our building, you know, any given day. So, um, you know, we've tried to establish kind of operating models that incorporate efficiency, um, you know, address, of course, you know, great service uh, and direction to to all the our visitors. But yet at the same time, um, you know, we, we can never staff enough people in this place to kind of, you know, one on one with every single person that walks in. So technology is is really important in that kind of uh, guiding process for our guests to come in and, and uh, discover our product, discover our food, discover, you know, the venue itself. Um, and we've really leaned heavy on that over the last um, over the last year or so to um, to help us grow. That is quite a busy tap room, Tony. And it's awesome that you incorporate so many different aspects, whether it's the staff or technology to provide that, you know, the most efficient guest experience you can. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's always a balance, you know, it's like, you know, coming from a smaller tap room experience that like what we had, you know, over a dozen years ago uh, to, to kind of grow to this type of model. You know, there's been a lot of growing pains involved you know, where you don't want to leave people behind, you know, the people that really have supported you throughout those years, and they've come to expect one set of experiences, and now you're kind of leading them into another. So we really try to, you know, diversify what we do. So like, you know, if you still want that interaction, you can still get up to the bar, you can still, you know, kind of talk to, you know, our bartenders and get that beer knowledge. Um, but you can also now uh, do other things, you know, like sit down and uh, order remotely, you know, you can, uh, have your private event in a whole separate space. So it's, it's all about kind of, you know, thinking, thinking through what people are looking for, who they are, identifying who they are as soon as they come in through the door, hopefully, and then, uh, guiding them to a, an experience that really fits what they're looking for. That's right. Your tour guides are craft beer experience. I love it. Now, moving on to Tim, because Tim, you know, you once were at the brewery a little bit more than you are now. Tell me about that experience. I, I will be fast, actually, because I learn from all my clients. In fact, I can say safely, all three of these guys already taught me something because we don't have a greeter at this restaurant and there should be one. And we've been debating it for forever. Um, so believe it or not, this is actually the restaurant where GoTap was born. If you can see the inside there, it's three stories tall. It is a logistical pain in the ass. <laughs> um, and so that, that's actually kind of why GoTab started was because just getting beers to people who are spread out and don't want to stand in massive lines. So just to be clear, I'm a big believer in interaction. So, and I think all, all three of these guys are big believers in interaction. Everybody wants to, when you go to a new brewery, go to the counter, taste beers, talk about beers, that's fun. What's not fun is going back to that counter to get a second beer or going back to the counter to get a third beer. That just becomes frustrating. Um, and so we're like, this one is actually counter serve. My other breweries, my wife's other brewery is a full service one. So I, I kind of have my feet in both different models. It's actually kind of fine dining. It's, it's totally weird. Um, but yeah, this, this is very similar to these guys. And I'm sure actually they just taught me a bunch of stuff in their models, but it, it, is, it did start in QRs. It was doing QR ordering in 2018, mainly because we couldn't figure out how to logistically get beers to tables. And we had lines coming out the doors, like way down the street. And it was just a mess. Um, so this is kind of how it started. Uh, they're they're going to teach you more, I'm sure, because they've got more sense of hospitality. 
Well, Tim, I think you're going to provide a lot of insight on the next question. You know, when it comes down to order and experience, I don't know about you all, but I imagine you probably dislike lines as much as I do. Yes. And they can be one of the most frustrating things when you walk into a tap room for the first time and you see a massive line. Because I imagine so many guests, they'll just might even just leave. You know, no one likes to wait in the line. So I'd love to hear, Tim, you know, what your thoughts are on lines, how they impact the guest experience. And it sounds like you've created a solution to solve that problem. I think anticipation once is great. Like a little bit of back pressure that says, hey, you know, this would be really exciting. You can build up the excitement standing in line to go taste the beers. But all these guys have great beers. And once you've done that once, getting it the second time is not so much fun. And I just, my belief is people are awesome. But just like Tony said, sometimes you just want to chill on the patio and not do that. I personally, I am like so opposed to lines as a technologist with that technology background. I'm like, sometimes I want it and sometimes I don't. <laughs> and, and I will just turn around and walk away anytime I see a sufficiently long or line at any venue, whether it's coffee, beer, lunch, it doesn't matter. I'll just, I'll turn and go. And I can assure you there's plenty of people that way, probably in, in this call. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Uh, we, um, we really want to have a line that's no more than two groups, one being served and one behind it. And uh, one of the things that we've done over the last year, as we've scaled up a lot of our events and our daily services, really making sure that we put those efficiencies in place so that there's a line that's you know, people feel like there's some pressure, they know where to go, uh, but also it goes fast enough where they don't feel like they're losing out on their life by waiting in line. Uh, and uh, with the rollout of GoTab and pushing more to QR codes, what we're finding is that lines are much more self-regulating as well. And that as the line starts to get to a certain length, people will prefer the QR codes. Uh, the other thing that uh, really uh, reduced line pressure for us was uh, getting rid of the pressure to close tabs. So we let people know they don't need to come and close their tab. It will just automatically close at the end of their at the end of their session. And that that took away just think about it half the line traffic. Uh, right. There's people that wanting to wanting to exit and uh, and select all the defaults. Uh, the other thing that we've done is. Uh, as we've done our festivals, we've kept online ordering and QR codes on. So one of the pictures that you showed when I was doing the introduction uh, was one of our concerts last year. I think it was uh, maybe in September. We had uh, 15 point of sale terminals going uh, and we had uh, three places where beer was being poured. Uh, and uh, the entire night with I think there were probably about 2,500 people there at peak. Uh, we never had more than you know two or three people in any one of those lines. Uh, and the online ordering, the beer was being delivered and food in, uh, in under a couple of minutes uh, to the point where people were weirded out and were saying, no, that's not my food. Like that was one of the problems we were having. There's 2,500 people. Somebody orders a beer. They're like, no, I just ordered it like 30 seconds ago. They're like, yeah, this is yours. Here you go. Uh, it's, almost like, it's almost too fast. Uh, and, and I think that that really shows you that while people, they like lines because it makes them, you know, it gives them time to think and time to acclimate and time to experience the space. Uh, when they just want to go and make a transaction happen or to go and uh, you know close their tab, they really don't want to mess with with waiting in lines. The other part is that as groups grow, and I think we you've seen this with all the pictures of these breweries. These are not people that are going with like by themselves to go sit at the bar and talk to the bartender. These are not places where people are going with one of their friends or their significant other. These are people that are showing up with two, five, 10, 20 of their friends. And if you're going to go and order, if you're ordering for around for your friends, I mean, how many beers can the normal person carry on a tray? I mean, they're going to be very awkward. So we also found that as the groups grew that come into the brewery, that they become less interested in standing in line because uh, they, they're all standing there. They're not finding a seat. And also only if you send one or two people, they can only carry so many drinks. So there's a lot of reasons to, to keep that, uh, that line pressure down uh, using technology. Really interesting observations there. And it's quite an impressive problem you had at your festival. So congratulations on that. Yeah, I've seen the numbers. His festivals kick ass. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> in the Mississippi. Yeah, that is awesome. So how, how does it work? You, you just have like QR codes plastered around the venue and people just scan it and, you know, go pick up. No, we have uh, tables. So we bring, we have all of our tables out on the patio. So the patio here is about, it's about 230 feet long by maybe 70 feet deep. And oh, wow. we put tables in norm, for normal service, but then we bring in uh, beer hall tables uh, and other round tables, like almost banquet tables and rounds for these events. And we put QR codes on every single table. So we go from having maybe about, um, I think our patio for normal service is about 550 seats. 
we then put about oh about a 800 900 seats out for our festival days and we pack them in closer together so that you're kind of in the you know you're, you can still watch the concert while you're there and we just make sure that everybody has a seat because that's the only way you can get food is is through a qr code so every single table every single seat has has qr codes on it and uh it is incredibly fast uh to to be able to run food and drink out when um you do things and i know tim you've talked about this before but just the fact that we can consolidate tickets on our KDS, and we're actually running the KDS is out in the outdoor bar. And so 10 people order on a table, it gets built onto a tray and brought to the table in one shot. Yeah, wow. Guinness, Guinness Brewery, by the way, does some crazy stuff. They, they run huge festivals similar to that. Nice. Now, Tony, I'd love to hear what you all do with regard to handling the lines. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny because before COVID, you know, we were a full service restaurant. It was almost kind of borderline, you know, more of that classic dining experience. You know, we had servers, we had sections, we had, you know, the whole deal, open table, people get sat, you know, made reservations. But, you know, COVID kind of changed everything because it was, you know, a big, you know, pause button. And, you know, when we reopened, well, here in Hawaii, you know, the entire island was closed off to any visitation from the mainland or anywhere else for months. So we had to rebuild from a very smaller, a much smaller pool of, you know, demographic guests, clients, you know, people that came to visit. And um, and so as we kind of rebuilt and built back up, you know, it was really just a process of, well, it didn't take, you know, 150 people to run the place you know, anymore. Right. It, it's like, I think we reopened with like 12 people and, you know, everyone just ran around, poured beers, try to get them to the right people. And we had lines, we had, you know, we switched over to counter service because it was more efficient, you know, and we added different counters along the way. I think we grew from like one counter to like five, you know, and, uh, and when that, you know, was still too slow when that was still just kind of like, uh, like you guys are saying, right. It's like that first time you're in line, it's kind of okay. You know, you're, you're hanging out. You might even strike up a, a cool conversation with someone next to you. You know, you have a little bit of, of time to scope out the menu and all that stuff. But, you know, by the time you're, you're done with your beer and you're back in line and you're in line for 10, 15 minutes just to get another beer, you know, that's, a sure way to kind of start pissing people off. So yeah, we were like, all right, we gotta, we gotta really change the model here and, and really pivot into, you know, something that we can evolve with. Um, but the one cool thing in that um, kind of growth curve was having those counters, having those lines showed us what we can actually do in that environment, right? So even as we grew, we we knew that we didn't want to lose the elasticity of our operating model with being able to run such a big place with a lot less people, you know, because human resource is just probably one of the largest constraints in, you know, any of our operations, I'm sure. So, um, so to have the elasticity of running a place with a smaller group of people, you know, having uh, choices, for our guests now with the QR code, they can, you know, not have to wait in line. And even now we kind of run a hybrid program and not too long ago, we actually brought back uh, our ordering stations where, you know, people that come from certain parts of the world, because we are such an international destination here in Maui, that they're not maybe used to using cell phones. Maybe they don't have the right SIM cards that allow them to, you know, jump on the network and stuff like that. So. Um, we still get people that struggle with the technology, right? So it's not like a, everyone all of a sudden is like perfectly in sync with QR codes because they're not, but 80% of them I'd say probably are. So for the other, you know, remaining 20%, you know, again, going back to the importance of being able to guide them now to either sitting at the bar so that they're, you know, getting handled by one of our bartenders or, you know, having, a place that's easily recognizable standing out in the lanai on our, you know, beer garden where they, they're like, oh, there's an attendant. There's somebody that I could go and step up and talk to. And sure, there's maybe a couple of people in line, but that at least takes away, you know, the majority of people that would be otherwise 
standing in line. And I love the fact that the technology with GoTab nowadays, you know, you can start that tab with someone, you know, after waiting in line and it literally sends it back to the guest, right? So even if they weren't familiar with the process, now it's simply like clicking a link on their phone or, you know, scanning something and now they continue to order from the same tab that they started. And, and that's been a huge, um, huge piece to kind of our strategy and our game plan as well. And it helps um, you beat those lines. Yeah. I, at the end of the day, people are here for beer, right? People are here to, you know, get down and, and, you know, try some beers and feed their kids. And, you know, I mean, um, we, we, we need to see that happen and um, see that happen relatively quickly. Yeah, Andrew, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, Andrew Copland, I don't know if you're familiar with the easy tab thing he's talking about, because I know Mike kind of pioneered it. Kudos to Mike. But uh, good job, yeah. Mike. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it basically it's for guests who don't want to create an account. They just dip a card and then it texts them their tab so they can order from their table without setting anything up. It's kind of nobody else does it. So that's the only reason I bring it up is it's kind of what I always thought I wanted because I hate setting up accounts. I don't want a password. But I also, I'm fine staying in line once. I don't want to stay in line again, right? So first time is a physical card. And it's kind of like Tony said, it, it gets them up the curve with a little, very little effort. Um, it's exciting to me because I, I like to include everybody. And like nobody nobody loves lines. I'll, t I'll tell you one quick anecdote before I, I didn't mean to steal Mike, Andrew. Um, the uh, Even before COVID, because we were doing QR ordering in 2018. Even before COVID, we saw on Saturday, Friday and Saturday nights at my brewery, where we we're doing QR ordering, 60% of the volume went through the QRs. And this is in a time period when nobody could scan a QR. But basically, when the line built up, to your point, Mike, people would figure out a way to not stand in the line. Like even some young person's like, hey, there's this thing, I can hack the system, right? Um, and so absolutely, a lot of people will figure out a way and it solves it for the people who want to stand in line too. So it's just a side note. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Tim. Now, back to Andrew with other half, because I believe you might be the only person on the panel today who once appreciated lines. You know, probably nothing <laughs> like seeing people lined up for hundreds of cases of beer. <laughs> uh, there is nothing like that. There is nothing uh, like having, you know, having hundreds of people outside. But I will say uh, our anniversary was uh, last Saturday. Um, and it was usually our biggest line of the year and all this stuff. And I was like, it was also uh, five degrees here um, <laughs> with like a 20 degree wind chill. And I was like, thank God. And I was talking to the two other guys that we had a text message at like 11 o'clock at night, midnight. I'm like, remember like three years ago when we had to do this? And we're all like, oh my God, this was terrible. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it was, and so yes, and, and I think that the all of this, you know, sort of new new way of thinking and the new, new POS systems that have helped that. Um, I, I, I agree that, you know, some people do actually kind of like being in lines and having that that feeling of like, oh shit, like what am I going to get that pressure that, that, that and that communication? Um, <clears throat> and that's where we are in, in, in Philly where we're using GoTab where um, it's sort of that hybrid model and you need, you know, I think uh, as Tony was saying, you kind of need to have those people around to ask questions. Um, Older people aren't necessarily as comfortable with the QR toads. Um, and even people that are, um, you know, super savvy really don't know the difference between uh, true green and green diamonds for us. And so they kind of need a little bit of help. And that's that's where we've actually seen a little bit of pushback on those QR codes is um, is that education component that that other half focuses on so much. Um, and, and if we're, we're doing pre-chef meetings where we're quizzing people on beer and yet they're ordering through a QR code, it's sort of antithetical. And how do you get that information? Uh, how do you how do you sort of put in a little bit of salesmanship, and also let the people be like, oh, I just want to, I just want a pilsner. Cool. It's it's coming in three minutes. Um, and I think that's what we're really struggling with right now is is that tension of, of how much is too much and how little is too little. Um, you know, I think with GoTab it's been fun because we literally have QR codes on our cornhole boards, and so you 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 do that, you can be standing there throwing a bag, and two minutes later there'll be a beer for you. Um, and I think that's where it's been really fun for us, um, where we're able to get product out fast and, and hopefully get people to enjoy it and, and, you know, not go too heavy, but like, you know, a lot of times you're like, oh, I, like I had one, but if I have to wait in that line again, I'm not going to order another one. And you want to be like, okay, cool. Just, just order right here. It'll be with you in a minute. Yeah. Um, 
so so it's been it's been a it's been an interesting evolution over the last six months and i'm interested to see how the spring and summer go um and how we sort of transition um people from a little bit more hands-off to a little bit more hands-on to get people that um that that other have experience because it, it is it is we all focused on hospitality really hard at the beginning um and that, but how do you have hospitality when you're ordering off of a qr code and that's where we're, we're trying to figure out and ideally, I imagine it comes down to making the ordering process efficient, allowing your team to take the time to have that extra, you know, engaging experience where you have the time to educate on the beers you yeah. mentioned. 100%. And then also, that's why all of us have greeters as well, because that's where it's important, you know, important. You have to have this, these different levels that five years ago, you might not have had to have. You had servers everywhere. Um, and now we're trying to, you know, you do save some labor, but you got to put some labor back in. So it's, you know, we're not, we're not 100% right. We're just trying to figure it out like everybody else. Yeah. Side note, Tim, I haven't visited your brewery before, but when I finally visit, I'm not going to tell you when. I expect a greeter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make a hard press tonight uh, when the boss gets on. So. I'm only about three hours from you, so it could happen at any point, maybe even tonight. There you go. There you go. But, you know, one thing all of you had touched on a bit, you know, is the labor challenges we're facing right now. I think the day doesn't go by where I talk about staffing challenges with someone in our industry. And a lot of you have talked about how you're facing these challenges and having and how you're solving these problems. Does anybody have any additional tips to, you know, how to work with less staff or how to solve the problem of staffing challenges? I mean, I, yeah, I also, mean oh, sorry, good. I mean, here here in, in Hawaii, I feel like it's, you know, potentially even more problem than, than anywhere else because A, it's a really expensive place to live. You know, B, um, there's just, a very small amount of, I guess, real estate, you know, it's not like people can commute from hours away to, you know, come to work, right? It's like, if you are living on the other side of the island, you're probably not going to work here, you know? So it's, uh, our, our labor pools are extremely limiting. And so uh, with COVID, especially, a lot of people left, you know, a lot of people went back to the mainland and, you know, wanted to kind of get back with their families and, do their thing. So uh, we're still seeing, you know, a, a large recovery curve from the last couple of years where that, that labor pool hasn't filled back to where it was, you know, pre uh, pre pandemic. So um, for us, it's a, it's a challenge, but I think really our goal is not to necessarily um, hire as many people as possible. It's to have the best team possible in play and it's to have, um you know a great workplace culture um to kind of develop that where honestly the best people that you can have working for you were the people that came because their friends already worked for you you know and and it's kind of like the people that that stack up and grow and you know build that core group and then hopefully that culture attracts other like-minded people who want to be a part of what has already been built so we try everything we can to, you know, help facilitate that process, help our team, you know, engage with each other so that, you know, they're stoked when they get to work, they're able to pass that stoke forward and, you know, just have a good time. And Tony, you're speaking my language. It's so important that people simply just get along. If you and I were working behind the bar with each other and we don't like each other, we're not going to help each other out. It's not going to be an efficient experience. When the line gets 20 deep, you know, we're not going to be working together to solve that problem. So simply, you know, having a team that's cohesive and the culture that you all have created, it's going to make for a more efficient ordering experience for sure. Absolutely. Now, what I want to dive into next, you know, this is something that I really look for when I go to a brewery, you know, as a husband and a dad, food is often an important part of that experience for me. I don't get to go out a lot. So if I can convince the family to go out for a, you know, the whole meal where we all get to hang out, it's really important. You know, for you all, if food is an important part of your experience, what are you currently offering and what has been your feedback since you've added food into the taproom experience? Uh, we opened with anybody food. jump in. Yeah, we, we opened uh, with food. We're one of the few breweries in uh, in the Minneapolis metro area that uh, that started with food there. A lot of people thought it was illegal for breweries to have food. And we're like, no, no, it's not. There's no no rule against it. And there's some weird we're still a three two state. We're the only one left. But we, we yeah. can sell food at our at our brewery. And uh, that's been a huge piece for us is that uh, it allows for a much more, uh, I'd say, diverse group of people to come and visit at all times of the day. Uh, 
you know, we have a lot of people that come for lunch. We have pe families that come. We have uh, different groups, uh, people doing, you know, like knitting events and all kinds of things. And, and having food allows for them to elongate the experience and not have to hop up and, and go somewhere else. Uh, and it also, you know, it, it allows you to have a, uh, a group of people that maybe don't like beer, that don't drink that much beer, that can come and hang out at a brewery for four hours and not feel like they're they're missing out and having to get up and go and find something to eat. So being, uh, food has been a really important part of our brewery, and uh, it's a really important part of the, the entire experience. Now, what is your menu like, Mike? Any, you know, menu highlights you want to share? Yeah, it's primarily pizzas and salads and some appetizers. Uh, but, you know, all of our, because of the the way that the menu is set, we actually set a menu so that the uh, the ticket time is less than three minutes for every, every single item, because people should be able to get their beer out at the same time as their food. Uh, and they usually are not ordering all at once. So we see a lot of progressive ordering as people come in. Uh, you know, it's not people sit down at once and then eat and then leave. A couple of people come in, they add a, more, a couple more people, maybe they add another table, maybe they switch tables, add order a bit more food. And so we see that as as more of the experience than more of a traditional, uh, you know, get seated, get the job, and then turn the table uh, for the next group. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I, I mean, I can tell you a quick anecdote from another brewery, not even a go, just someone I know. And it's interesting. He had a food truck one day a week. And on that one day a week, he was very meticulous. All of his customers who walked through the door would drink one extra beer. Just the day he had a food truck. And he didn't make any money up, but he sold one extra beer per customer. So if there's any reason to have food, I think that's a pretty clear reason. Both of our breweries open with, with food. Yeah, food's pretty huge for us. I mean, it's almost 50% of our, our total revenue, you know, so it's uh, it's a pretty significant piece of what, you know, people expect when they come to Maui Brewing anyways, um, you know, to kind of have a dining experience paired with their drinking experience. Um, and like I said, from day one, you know, we've always had that, um, you know, here in, in Hawaii, you know, craft beer wasn't really a big part of, of life. You know, like if you grow up here, it's mostly, you know, macro brands that are around that, you know, available in stores and things like that. So the food honestly brings in and have over the years brought in people that's discovered what craft beer is, you know, only because they were hungry for a burger and, you know, ended up walking away with like, oh my God, I didn't know, you know, coconut porter can be like this thing, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so, so it's been a great part of what we do. Uh, we've always, you know, had great uh, culinary teams and, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, if you look at the, the whole picture of how we've also been able to expand, expand the brand throughout, the state of Hawaii too, um, you know, that, that justifies so much of what we can do as, as a company and as a brand and, um, you know, allows us to have the financial resources to keep, uh, keep growing. So, um, yeah, it's been a really, really big part of, of our operation. And Tony, what does your menu look like? What type of offerings do you have available? Um, we do a little bit of everything. I mean, we just kind of start with the place of, what would I drink my beer with, you know, kind of thing. And uh, mostly that's going to be like pizzas, you know, sandwiches, burgers, but also a variety of, you know, appetizers and, and share plates. Um, and, and one of the things that we've always done here in, in Maui uh, and throughout the state of Hawaii is partner with our local, you know, agricultural growers, you know, ranchers, people that, you know, are, are really important parts of our community and uh and to support local to support that process so a lot of times it's like you know we just will make things because you know our friend pat hauled in a hundred pound tuna and uh let's let's serve that bugger you know uh so you're just bragging now tony <laughs> yeah, totally. not fair. mike's not thrown fair. out the mississippi you're throwing out a hundred pound tunas come oh, on yeah. Guys. yeah 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 well you know and and, you know, it's like celebrating the, the providence of, of what we have around because, you know, big part of being here is that if we don't make it, if we don't do it locally, then it has to get barged here. Right. So the logistics of all of that is very involved. And uh, as much as possible, we, we like to celebrate, you know, our resource um, independence and uh, support that process. So. Um, so, yeah, you know, it varies again, you know, seasonality plays in. 
and um, and and our team has been very very great, very creative about um, utilizing. Um, yeah, you have around them. You have a great chef in culinary, so it's not surprising. Yeah, smart guy. Yeah, very cool, Andrew. What are your thoughts on food? Uh, you know, I'm the same as everybody else here. I think the importance of it is becoming. Um, you know, greater and greater. We started off uh, with no food, with, you know, barely food trucks. And now uh, we're making sure two of our locations have food. Um, we're adding food to the others. And, and when we don't have food, we're making sure that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are covered by food trucks. Um, I think the hardest part is, um, you know, getting that cohesion between everything and making sure people know, um, as Tony was saying, like coming in the door and, and celebrating, whether you have a hundred pound tuna or celebrating cheesesteaks as we have in Philly, um, making sure that it's somewhat local, but also making it um, approachable. I think uh, my background, actually, I was a chef for 15 years, and then we opened up the brewery. Um, and so it's it's near and dear to my heart, but it's also, it's it's uh, it's really difficult right now. And, and I think the biggest thing we focus on is making sure that you have something for the four-year-old who's screaming on the table, uh, the person who doesn't drink beer, and and then the everybody in between. Um, that's that's one of the, the, the fun parts. Um, but, I'll, you know, I had my meeting with the chef right before this call um, to say, like, hey, what's on it's the Philly, the one that's we concentrate most on. I'm like, hey, what, what are we putting on the menu for the Super Bowl? What are we what are the specials we're going to do? What are we going to do to take advantage of um, a lot of those food items? Um, is like what comes from the, the culture of the, of the town, uh, whether it's Finger Lakes or New York or down there. I'm sure each of those tap rooms has great, unique local food offerings as well. The, the, you know, lots of pizzas and lots of burgers. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I mean, like with regard to food, you know, guests are going to spend more. They're going to hang out longer. And while I don't have data on it, you know, wearing my secret hopper hat, I, I do have data that shows, you know, when you ask guests if they'd like to purchase that second beer, they're going to magically spend six dollars and fifty cents more. So I imagine it's a similar effect when you say, hey, would you like to order something while you're drinking that or this pair is perfectly? The guest is going to spend more and you're going to see higher tabs. It's a win win for everybody. Yeah. Well, and frankly, it's safer because you're not drinking on an empty stomach. No, yeah, you, you nailed it, Tim, on that one. Yeah. Now, to yeah. dive into one more talking point, I don't think a few years ago we would have been even mentioning direct-to-consumer in a conversation about the tap room. But your e-commerce offerings, they're an extension of the tap room. So I'd love to hear each of your e-commerce offerings, you know, and where it falls in importance for your business model. I think Andrew should go first because I, 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 he does some really cool stuff. Uh, cool or incredibly weird. and uh, <laughs> I, I like weird. Um, yes. So, you know, again, we, we were lucky enough five years ago to open up the door and sell beer. Uh, that all changed with COVID. And when that happened, we um, scrambled, but we had a great team and were able to, to capitalize on um, basically overnight, we set up a entire um, distribution to get home distribution. So instead of having the waiting in line for the beer, we brought the beer to everyone. Um, and we needed a, you know, Craft Peak, which is our website provider. Uh, handled a lot of that for us and it took a couple of weeks, but we really hammered them We're like, okay, we have maps, we have routing, we have all of that. And so that was one facet that was sort of strange to us. We do all of our own distribution. So, and then, and then also we, about halfway through the pandemic, we were like, started researching the laws and figured out where we could ship. Um, so we basically ship anywhere that we can get the beer. If we, if it goes into the mail on Tuesday, it can be there by Friday. So we go down about Florida and then go up to, to Ohio and, to the Northeast, anywhere that is legal. And, you know, that was, that was a huge boon for our business. And it was really, that was a lot of logistical things too. Um, I think we, we hired a guy to handle uh, the online merch and then we're like, so this is gonna be a little bit bigger than we thought it was gonna be, <laughs> I think he's still recovering. Um, but then it also flows into the tap room where we still do, we still have our big releases that like do get hundreds, thousands of people across our locations to come in. Um, and, and we need the infrastructure to have that, you know, the, the one thing that we're waiting for in the world is that, is that sort of provider, uh, that, that backend provider, whether it's GoTab or not to have that seamless, you know, experience across all of our, uh, uh, revenue streams. So someone can go onto our website, they know how to order beer for their home. They know how to order beer for curbside pickup. They know how to order a hamburger when they get to locations. Um, are the also marrying with our, our our systems of inventory and our production levels because it, you know i'm sure all of you guys are the same it's hard when you, you're like I, I know i made a thousand cases of this beer i know i made 200 cases but somehow we only sold 170 where did this beer go and yes sometimes it falls over in the truck i'm sure it falls over in the uh, in, in in the uh, in the boat from one island to another um but it's it's really 
you know, it's really interesting. We're really hoping in the next, you know, couple of years, there's a there's a seamless way to go from what we use Obeer, uh, from Obeer to our POS systems, to our sales, to our online, and really make some. And and what we're looking for is just information, um, because we really want to know that someone comes in and when there's food, they order one more beer. We want to be able to prompt people, which has been great with GrowTab. We want to be able to prompt people um, and say like, oh, you know, you love you. Last time you heard you ordered six Citra beers. Hey, Citra week's coming up next week. There's a package in the mail if you want to get it. You can come into our locations for the special tasting flight. Um, and that marketing, which is our next step, uh, we you know, which we had a long conversation with Tim last week, uh, that, that, that direct marketing, which is coming back, uh, you know, integrating with our with our uh, social media and all of that marketing is we're, we're hoping that it's sort of the seamless thing. And that's what we're, we're trying to get to. That was a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> Aren't we all trying to get there? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Tony and Mike, you know, what are your, all your current, you know, uses of the DTC and the e-commerce? You know, here here in Hawaii, you know, we have some inherent challenges with direct to consumer, right? I mean, logistics, shipping, it just doesn't really make it easy for us to, you know, get our product out to people that way. Uh, not to mention, you know, the legalities of certain markets and, and things like that. So there are third party um, groups that will ship our beer once it on the mainland to different markets, but it's a pretty small part of our, our business model at this point. Um, you know, that said, you know, our, our e-commerce, you know, we've, we've had that running for a while and, you know, we're now using third party kind of distribution, uh, centers to, to do that and help us with that. Um, but it's still kind of, a relatively small slice of what we do otherwise, because at our, um, you know, our, our physical sites, you know, we'll do, I mean, we probably sold $2 million worth of retail last year. You know, and it's a it's a significant amount, but it's also because people are here. They had an interaction. They, you know, do what what is that they do, and now they want to bring the beer home with them. Now they want to, you know, get that crowler of something special they found. They want to, you know, kind of get that hat or T-shirt or or whatever it is. Um, but we recently, you know, brought in another brand into our craft Ohana fold, and that that's Modern Times, and they have a killer direct to consumer program. So we are looking to learn more from, you know, from our new uh, partners there and, uh, and hopefully, you know, uh, see what, you know, the world opens up. It's going to be a fun year. No, I appreciate everybody tuning in today. I have one final question for all of our guests and Mike, because you began, we're going to end with you as well. And that question is, you know, first off, we've touched on a lot of great aspects of hospitality and that ordering experience today, but is there any other additional strategy you'd like to call out for something that's helped you generate greater success in the tap room? Yeah, I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, one thing is that uh, as we've grown and as we've uh, kind of come out of COVID like we all have and figure out these new models, really just making sure that we keep creating spaces for our guests to uh, find seats and not wait in lines. And I know it, it seems really basic, but uh, we're tripling the size of our tap room right now. It opens in April. Uh, we added another seven bathrooms to it. Uh, we didn't add another bar, uh, but we are adding a ton of seats. So it's really about making sure that people can come in and use breweries as a third space that they don't have to get moved out of. And as long as we keep providing that third space for them, uh, that that is what's generating traffic. Um, on top of that, we also do a ton of events. Uh, I think we have uh, 16 event days scheduled this year, which just allows us to bring different audiences together into uh, and to enjoy a, a night of music. What's been the most unusual but successful event you've had in the past year? <laughs> Everybody's like hands on their chin. We're all so curious. Yeah, I'd say uh, the most unusual. Let's see. We did a uh, we had a a local professional wrestling circuit that came through and uh, set up a ring, set up all the chairs around it and ran a uh, ran a wrestling and we didn't have any outdoor lights. So this is like 500 people watching this wrestling match and it got dark because it was in the fall. And so it's Minnesota, it's like high latitudes. So the audience all held up their cell phones with the camera lights on and the camera lights were lighting the wrestling ring. You just you can't make something like that up, right? That's just it's wow. it's so that, was, that was pretty unique. That is pretty cool, and I definitely need to see a picture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Andrew, from other half, you know, any other tips you'd like to offer on how you've been able to create a successful tap room experience? I think the biggest one is just listen listen to your employees and listen to the customers come in. 
Um, I think, you know, being, I, I, being there from the beginning and selling cans and being part of that culture and uh, always uh, let people know who I was and people, uh, customers always have to come up and talk and say, this person was great. Hey, I had an experience like this. Um, it was, you know, it's much better than looking at Google and Yelp being like, what happened here? Um, and I think that's the way you're saying, listen and, and be part of that. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's hard for me when we go, I go to the DC brewery um, and I'm not, I'm there once every six weeks, eight weeks and talking to the managers and be like, well, what can we do better? And it's really listening to them and being like, how you tell me I'm only here to support you. And that's what uh, I really try to do in my role. No, I love that. All great ideas. And I'll have to add your DC brewery to the visit when I go up to Tim's and visit Caboose. At least you just let me know because I'm going to, I'm going to go with huh? you. I'm gonna, oh I'm yeah, definitely. Shop, good time, Andrew. I just haven't met his wife yet. So it's going to be a very big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tony, how about you? Any unique tips you want to offer up? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think one thing that we're, we're really looking forward to this year is kind of the dust is finally settling from, you know, all of the pandemic madness is to get back in, you know, a little bit more of a routine business planning, you know, the way that we used to run businesses, I guess, you know, uh, that flattened the curve, if you will. But uh, there's been so many surprises along the way over the last couple of years. And some of it's really been awakening and, and, and awesome to kind of experience and go through. But, you know, just kind of realizing not just how to, you know, fly by the seat of our pants and, and just go, 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 but also when to pause, when to, you know, like Andrew was saying, ask the right questions, you know, get the, get the right feedback so that we know how to grow sustainably. Um, so that we know how to grow smart and not just, you know, kind of uh, blindly strike out. And, uh, and that's a huge goal for us, you know, moving into, you know, this year and beyond, um, you know, getting back to some of the basics that, you know, again, just we haven't had the time to catch our breath and, and think about. So, um, so, yeah, good things to come, hopefully. And here's to successful 2023 and beyond. Thank you. Tim, last but not least, bring us home. Uh, I mean, I can't top these guys, honestly. They, they, they do way cooler stuff than, than I can pretend to do. So and I'm not even in, I'm just facilitating. So I'm trying to learn. Well, Tim, um, if anyone's interested in getting a hold of you or learning more about GoTab, how can they do so? Uh, GoTab.com is pretty easy. That's pretty easy. Well, everybody, you know, thank you for joining us today. I know I found today's conversation inspiring. Appreciate you all for sharing so much insight. Mike, Andrew, Tony, Tim, I look forward to sharing beers with you very soon or surprise beers in your tap room. We'll see everybody soon. Have a great day. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Bye.